Wrongfully accused of murdering his wife, Richard Kimball, uh, played by Harrison Ford in the movie The Fugitive, escapes from the law in an attempt to find his wife's killer and clear his name. Pursuing him is a team of U.S. Marshals led by Deputy Samuel Gerard, played by Tommy Lee Jones, a determined detective who will not rest until Richard is captured. As Richard is on the run as a fugitive, he discovers the secrets of his wife's death and struggles to expose the killer before he's captured. In the Old Testament, David is also a fugitive who runs from Saul who's trying to kill him. Like a mouse chased by a hawk, he's on the run. Now turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you'd like to use our Bibles under the seats, it's on page 289. Uh, so far in our look at David, we've seen that he's called by God a man after God's own heart. Uh, because David has kind of an up and down history, we're asking well, why is he called a man after God's own heart? And we're asking the question, how can we become people after God's heart? Uh, we've seen so far that David has been anointed to become the next king of Israel. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he goes out and he fights the giant Goliath and defeats him. A major victory. Saul is impressed and so he hires him to work at the palace. And he names him as one of his leaders in the army. And he's very successful. So he becomes very popular with the people. Saul gives him his daughter, McCall, in marriage. His son, Jonathan, who's the heir to the throne, becomes David's best friend. Then one by one, David loses all of these because he's on the run from Saul. He has to flee. David runs, looking over his shoulder, sleeping with one eye open, eating with his chair next to the restaurant exit. Where can he go? He flees to the city of Nob. Ahimelech is the chief priest there, and he has 85 priests for him. He has so many priests that it's called the city of priests. Running in panic, David faces his most desperate days, and he makes some poor decisions. David went to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? This was very unusual. David was a, a commander in the army. He always traveled with a regiment of men. David answered Ahimelech the priest, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission. I am sending you on. That was a lie. He wasn't on a mission from Saul. He was fleeing from Saul as a fugitive. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. That was a lie too. His men were not with him. He was alone. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day in Nob, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. So when David saw Doeg, he knew he was in trouble. He knew Doeg would go back and tell Saul where he was. So he fled from Nob. That day, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Do you remember Gath? Gath is the city where Goliath came from. It's a Philistine city. Why would he go to a Philistine city? Because he's desperate. He tries to form, forge a friendship based on a mutual adversary. If your enemy is Saul and my enemy is Saul, we're friends, right? In this case, wrong. The Gittites are not hospitable. But the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David, the king of the land? They knew that David was anointed to be the next king. Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David panics. He's a lamb among wolves. Tall men, piercing glares, sharp spears. We'd like to hear David whisper a prayer to God. Or pronounce his confidence in God's strength like he did to Goliath. 
But David doesn't see God. So again, he takes matters into his own hands. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. In Nob, he tells a lie. In Gath, he lives a lie. He pretends to be insane. The Philistines believed that epileptics were possessed by the devil and they would cast them out of their cities. That's what David is hoping they will do and that's exactly what they do. They cast him out of the city gates and he's on his own. Chapter uh, 22. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. He goes to the only place he can think of. The place where no one goes because nothing survives. He goes to a honeycombed cave that overlooks the Dead Sea. Have you ever been to Israel and seen the Dead Sea? It's just like it says. It's a Dead Sea. There's no outlet for the water. And it's surrounded by mountains and desert. It's got to be one of the ten worst places in this world. We estimate that David was 20 when he fled from Saul. He doesn't become king until he's 30. So he's beginning life as a fugitive for a decade in the desert. Can you relate to, uh, to David? Has your Saul cut you off from the position you held and the people you loved? In an effort to land on your feet, have you stretched the truth? Are you seeking refuge in Gath? Under normal circumstances, you would never go there. But these aren't normal circumstances. So you loiter in the hometown of trouble. Her arms or that bar. You walk shady streets and frequent questionable places. And while there, you go crazy. You wake up in a dead sea cave at the lowest point in your life. Whether you're a teenager, single, married, widowed, or divorced, how can you rise above the death of a loved one? An accident, a debilitating illness, the loss of a job, or criticism from someone you valued as a trusted friend. You stare out at the barren desert of an uncertain future and ask, what do I do now? I suggest you let David be your teacher. Sure, he went wacko for a few verses, but in the cave of Adullam, he gathers himself. The giant killer rediscovers courage. He returns his focus to God. And that's the key for you. Put your focus on God. Uh, this month we've found that this is a major theme in the life of David. David's called a man after God's own heart. Why? He put his focus on God. When all the other soldiers put their focus on Goliath, he focused on God. And here again we find he focused on God. I find three things in our text today that will help you focus on God. One, cry out to God. Many of David's psalms are written during this decade in his life. Turn to Psalm 57. It's right in the middle of your Bible. If you want to use our Bibles, it's on page 569. Many of the psalms have a superscription at the top. They tell us who wrote it and when. Uh, the context gives richness to the psalm. David wrote this, it says when he fled from Saul into a cave, presumably the cave of Adullam. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Can you feel what David feels? He's in terror. He's running from Saul as a fugitive. They spread a net for my feet. 
I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path. David cries out to God for deliverance. We all have moments when we wonder, why did this happen? What are you doing, Lord? Mother Teresa was ministering to a woman who had cancer, and she was in severe pain. Mother Teresa said, when you feel the pain, think of Jesus kissing you. So next time you're suffering from pain, just imagine that Jesus is kissing you. And she said to Teresa, she said, tell Jesus to stop kissing me. I'm with her. When you're afraid or discouraged, don't hide it. David was called a man after God's own heart. Why? Well, for one, he was very honest with God. He didn't hide his fears. From the darkness of the cave, he cries out to God. The place to begin in overcoming discouragement is to become honest like David. Admit you're discouraged. One of the things I love about my wife, Jory, is when she's discouraged, she's always able to identify why. She'll tell me it's because this happened. Sometimes we have a hard time identifying our feelings and expressing them. Legos sold 100,000 uh, Legos sets one year, and the sets had a crucial piece missing. But only 2,000 customers contacted them to complain. From that, Legos developed their theory that uh, whenever you get a complaint, multiply it by 50. And so I use that principle as, as a leader in the church. I figure if somebody talks to me, certainly if two people talk to me about the same problem, I figure for everyone that talks to me, there are probably 50 others that have the same concern, but they just don't bother to tell me. It's often difficult to identify our, our, you know, what, we're, what we're feeling. In the throes of discouragement, you can't just seem to shake feelings of depression. Identify what's got you down and pour out your feelings to God. In our journals, usually the last question each week is to write a prayer to God. I use this, this question to try to get to my feelings. What am I feeling in my life? Until you verbalize your sadness, you'll not be likely to rise above it. Two, determined to praise God. Psalm 57, David writes, I will take fret refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. He takes refuge in the shadow of God's wings. Now, God's not a bird. This is poetry. Feel the safety of hiding beneath an eagle's wings. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. In the midst of his terror, as running as a fugitive, David maintains a firm confidence in God. David is running for his life from Saul, and he's hiding in a cave. He has enemies all around him, but rather than focusing on them, he fixes his mind on God. He makes a choice. Rather than fret and worry, he praises God. David remembers how God delivered him from the men at Gath. When they discovered who he was, he pretended to be insane. And then they kicked him out of the city. He got away. And so he praises God for delivering him. Six of the 11 verses in Psalm 57 contain praise. David works through his struggles of desperation to praise. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. Uh, David makes a vow to praise God. I will sing and make music. He says, I will praise you. He resolves to praise. He could feel sorry for himself, but instead he chooses to praise God. It's a choice. It takes some effort. He has to rouse himself to do it. He says, awake, 
my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. It doesn't come naturally. You can't say, you know, I'm just not the praising type of person. That's not me. It isn't David either. He chooses to focus on God and praise him rather than dwell on his problems. I'm not talking about pretending to be happy. I'm talking about resolving to keep our focus on God and become praisers until we become confident that God can handle the situation we're in. That's what David does. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. The summer after my freshman year in college, I worked at a Denny's restaurant as a cook. Typically, I'd start at 5 p.m. and work till 2 a.m. And one night, this guy came in late at night, drunk and angry. Something one of the waitresses said ticked him off, and he just kind of got up and went crazy. He was swearing at everybody, and he got into the cook station where I was and grabbed one of our big knives and was, you know, walking around with it. I was scared to death. Our assistant manager took a, a scalding uh, pot of coffee and threw it at him. Well, that just made the guy hotter. I mean, he was really mad at that point. Someone called 911 and the police came quickly and thankfully nobody got hurt. As I left that night, I was still shaking as I drew, drove home and I praised God for protecting me and everybody else in the restaurant. When I got home, I woke up my parents and I told them what had happened. I told them how, how afraid I was in that cook station and how I praised God on the drive home. By sharing my praise with my parents, I increased my praise. Psalm 34 is another psalm that David wrote during this time. Uh, the inscription at the top tells us it was written uh, when David feigned insanity before Ahimelech, who drove him out and he left. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Uh, David is a fugitive. In spite of his troubles, running for his life, he praises God. His attitude reflects a determination to praise in the midst of trouble. Praise is not a matter of circumstances. It's not something we do just when everything's going great. It's a choice. It's something we choose to do in the midst of our life, in the midst of our troubles. When you're facing difficult times and everything in, inside you cries, it's time to give up. Don't do that. Do as David does. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Praise will transform your attitude. David tells us the reason for his praise to God. I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he was stuck in Gath and there he, he thought they were going to kill him and he feigned insanity and they let him go and, and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. When you're facing huge problems, determined to praise God, it will keep your focus on God. Three, find strength and comfort in people. For Samuel 22, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. Turns out that the cave of Adullam is only 12 miles from Bethlehem where David grew up where his family lived, so they came to him and encouraged him. And all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Not what you would call a corps of West Point cadets, in trouble, in debt, discontented, quite a crew. Some were under distress because of Saul. Remember, Saul is unraveling. Some are in debt, maybe due to Saul's heavy taxation. Still others are 
discontented. Maybe they've been wronged by Saul or somebody in his administration. And their spirits were beginning to sour. Just like the church. Strong churches are populated with current and former cave dwellers. They told a few lies in Nob. They went loopy in Gath. And they haven't forgotten it. And because they haven't, they imitate David. They make room for you. I mean, who's David to turn these men away? He's no candidate for archbishop. He's a magnet for marginalized people. So David creates a community of God-seeking misfits. His band grew to 600. 23.13, so David and his men, about 600 in number, left Kayla and kept moving from place to place. He's a fugitive. They're on the run. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Kayla, he did not go there. David recognized his needs for friends. He was alone in a desolate cave. He needed people. And these people were discontented. They were in trouble. They needed help too. So he welcomed them in. You have to see the needs of people and the needs of your organization. Every week, 50,000 people gather at St. James Park to watch Newcastle United Soccer Club. Every week they see a poor performance. Then in 2012, they finished fifth in the standings. This is the premier soccer league. They have 20 teams in the league. So what'd they do? They gave all their coaches raises and kind of unbreakable long-term contracts and they kept all the same players. Their philosophy was that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The next year they dropped to 16th place. They were shocked. They thought the league table never lies. But professional gamblers say the league standings always lie. Professional gamblers look at things like goal differentiation. How many more goals does your team score than the opponents? In 2012, Newcastle only scored five more goals than their opponents. The teams that finished sixth, seventh, and eighth all had a higher goal differentiation. So like if in two games you score two goals and your opponent scores six, you better hope you win one game 1-0 one and you lose the other 1-6. Professional gamblers also look at shot differentiation. How many more shots on goal do you, does your team get than your opponents? The league table is not a good measure of how healthy your team is. Their team had needs that need to be fixed, but they didn't address them. They didn't see the needs of their organization. David's family came to see him. 600 men gathered around him. And his friend Jonathan paid him a visit. 2315, while David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You'll be king over Israel, and I'll be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. David was in desperate days. He did some foolish things. Then he escaped to the cave of Adullam. He cried to God. He determined to praise God, and he found comfort in people. David found all three. So did Whit Criswell. Criswell grew up in Kentucky in a Christian family. When he was in high school, he was very involved in his youth group. In college, still the same. When he got out of college, he was very involved in the church, became a leader in the church. Then he got caught up in gambling. He bet on baseball, and he lost more than he won. He found himself in desperate debt to his bookie. To solve his problem, he decided to uh, embezzle funds from the bank where he worked. Welcome to Gath. It was only a matter of time before auditors figured out the problem. 
And sure enough, they scheduled an appointment with him. The night before his examination, he couldn't sleep. He decided to take the path of Judas. He wrote out a suicide note that his wife would see, and he took the car outside Lexington to take his life. He said, go ahead and do it. You no good fool. This is what you deserve. But he couldn't do it. He kept thinking about how it would devastate his wife and his kids. They thought if he took his life, he would go to hell. He wouldn't get into heaven. So early in the morning, he drove back, and his wife had found the suicide note, and she met him and gave him a huge hug, and she had called 911. The police were there, so they took him into custody. It was very humiliating for him to be arrested in front of his family and neighbors, but it was also liberating. He didn't have to lie anymore. His cave of Adulam was a prison cell. There he met a band of brothers, other people who were trying to follow Christ. And he returned his focus to God. He renewed his faith. When he got out of prison, he worked in the church. He volunteered wherever he could to be of help. Eventually, he got hired to be on the staff. And in 1998, he was hired as a senior pastor of a church. And today, that is one of the fastest growing churches in Kentucky. Are you in the desert? Do you feel like a fugitive, like Richard Kimball, running for your life? Put your focus on God. Cry out to God, praise God, and find comfort in people. Give your life to Christ and throw your hat in a congregation like this one of people who are one gift of grace removed from tragedy, addiction, and disaster. Seek community in the church of Adulam. Cry out to God, determine to praise God, and find comfort in God's people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story of David in desperation, running as a fugitive. He's scared. He doesn't know where to go, what to do. He made some mistakes. Then he found his faith again in you. And we want to do that today. I want to give you a moment just to cry out to God and talk to him. Would you tell him what you're desperate about? What is it that you're afraid of? What is it that you're worried about? Makes you feel out of control. It's very important to be able to identify those feelings. Tell them to God. And then tell him this week that you want to determine to praise him in the midst of that. And then you want to find fellowship with people that are trying to fo follow Christ. You, you pray right now. Thank you, Father, that you are a great God. You want to have a relationship with us. You want us to cry out to you in need. Help us to do that, not to go it alone. And help us to determine to praise you and focus on you. And then help us to not try to do things alone, but to find fellowship with other people, our family, friends, people in the church. In Jesus' name we pray.